explore us. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. If you haven't listened to It's All Greek to Me Part 1, I'd go back and do that before getting into this one. How else will you know what kind of underwear to wear? Before we start, make sure to go and pull up the lady-centric timeline and map I made you too, which should help you make sense of the world we're currently exploring. You'll find them both in this episode's show notes. And you know I've got to give my patrons a shout-out. My pirate queens, Anna, Emily, Jackie, Jessica B., Kayla, and Wendy. And my lady presidents, Alexis, Amy, Brendan, Audrey, Avery, Jordan, Caroline, Cassie, Claire, Courtney, Dana, Debbie, Edie, Elizabeth, Ellie, Eve, Jackie C., Lori, Jessica S., Caitlin, Karen C., Karen R., Casey, Kat, Catherine, Lauren, Louisa, Meg, Nancy, Pamela, Paul, and Townsend. Becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month really helps keep the show going, and it gives you access to exclusive bonus episodes, sneak peeks, and more. To check it out, go to my website and click on Become a Patron. My gratitude is never-ending. So, where were we in our explorations of ancient Greece? Ah, uh, yes, Tom Hiddleston was lifting our veils and getting ready to show off that body he hit the gymnasium so hard for. Not feeling particularly amorous? Never mind that. Your consent is probably optional. A man is the head of the household, and this is a society ruled by gods who take women by force with startling frequency. We can't presume to know how things actually go down behind closed Greek doors, and Tom's a gentleman, so we'll hope for the best. Keep in mind that the expectation is that you'll be pregnant as soon as humanly possible. And besides, sex is good for you. The top doctors all say so. Like Hippocrates. Women who have intercourse are healthier than those who abstain, for the womb is moistened by intercourse and ceased to be dry. Whereas when it is drier than it should be, it contracts violently, and this contraction causes pain. Helpful hint. There is a lot of social pressure coming your way about baby making. You'll want to have a boy first and foremost, but a girl would be okay too, I guess. Just not too many of them, as we'll have to provide them all with dowries. In this age of bad hygiene and confusing notions about how our bodies work, children often die young, so you'll need to produce a gaggle of them. That way, at least a few might make it. You may try and slow down the baby train with potions, herbs, vinegar, woolen pads soaked in honey, cedar resin. In one of Homer's plays, a character suggests using Penny Royal, a wild plant that would be easy enough for us to find and will be used for this purpose for centuries to come, even into the 19th century. Though the Hippocratic Oath does say one shouldn't give a lady a potion specifically to rid her of a pregnancy, it doesn't seem like abortion is illegal here. One Hippocratic text, called The Nature of the Child, suggests that a woman wanting to end a pregnancy should lick her heels to her butt a few times. That doesn't sound like it will end well for anybody. Aristotle says that abortions should only happen before you can actually feel the baby moving, though this seems less about preserving the child's life and more about how much pollution a late-stage abortion is likely to cause. Pollution essentially meaning really bad karma and a dark miasma that can infect you and others. But more than likely, we'll be actively working to have Tom's baby. If you do get pregnant, it's because the man is very virile. If you can't, it's going to be called as your fault. Something's faulty with your womb, of course. There is no such thing as male infertility. I mean, look at Zeus. Even his reign gets women pregnant. The upside is that, once you bring a boy into the world, your household status is getting a definite boost. As matriarch, you'll get more respect and more deference. Until then, hang on tight. You'll give birth at home, probably surrounded by women. You'll have a maya, or midwife, to guide you through your birthing pains. A male doctor is unlikely to drop by unless you're in serious danger. 
It'll just embarrass you to have him there anyway, as I'll have to look at your private parts. For shame. In this age, anyone can be a doctor. Well, any man. As there's no official certificate. Though there are medical schools, like the one run by Hippocrates, who's responsible for the Hippocratic Oath doctors still swear by in our century. The body of work they're drawing on is vast and ever-shifting, employing remedies both physical and spiritual. They're likely to think that our bodies are defined by four humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. If any of these are out of balance, health problems ensue. Lots of things can impact your health, geographic location, diet, trauma, your general mindset. But they have some funny notions about your uterus. They believe in a female-only illness that we call hysteria, which comes from the Greek word hystera, or womb. The womb is a mobile creature that is prone to wandering off, causing all sorts of mischief, namely giving you wild mood swings and a wicked case of the crazies. As Arateus of Cappadocia puts it, It is very much like an independent animal within the body, for it moves around of its own accord and is quite erratic. The remedy? If it's wandered too far north, put sweet-smelling things by your lady palace to coax it back into place. If too far south, repel it home with foul smells. This is, of course, one of the reasons women are inferior to men and can't participate in politics. Right. For a whole lot more on hysteria through the ages, check out my Patreon bonus episode on the subject. Hopefully the goddesses are there with you as you birth your child. You're going to need them. You'll be placed under the protection of Aletheia, or She Who Comes, who will help bring your baby into the world. Once it's delivered, there's all that pollution to deal with. Having a baby is a dirty business, spiritually speaking, and creates what's called a miasma that can spread like an infection. <laughs> what's that I smell? Lady miasma? Horrors! Pitch is smeared on the walls to try and keep it from spreading beyond the room, and you'll have to be confined for several days to contain it. Just as well, giving birth in this age is a perilous business. Many women die. Miscarriages are common. As Medea says in a play by Euripides, I would rather stand in battle line three times than give birth once. Things take a somewhat dark turn from here. If a child is unwanted, or it's sickly, or deemed in some way inadequate, it might be left out in the elements, in a process called exposure. No one in ancient Greece condones killing a child, as such things create pollution. But exposure doesn't count as murder. It allows the gods to decide the child's fate. Over in Sparta, parents have to have their newborns inspected by a council. And if they're deemed weak, the parents have to expose them, by law. You'd be right to suspect that girls are more likely to be exposed than boys are. Some estimates put the number of girls exposed in Athens up to 10%. But much of what we know about exposure comes from plays and other works of literature, so we can hope it isn't actually a widespread practice. And it's likely there are always childless couples in Athens ready to swoop in and rescue the wee thing from the rocks. Consider this, too. Young girls aren't generally fed as well as boys are growing up, and they have to go through the perils of childbirth from a very young age. Take a long, hard look at the women around you. From what we know, it seems their lifespan, on average, will be some ten years shorter than the men of this city. This is not an easy place and time to be female. On a just slightly cheerier note, you might entrust breastfeeding your child to a wet nurse. That woman is likely to be a slave. It'll make you feel uncomfortable to know that slavery is very common here. Slaves come from all over, Illyria, Scythia, Lydia, Syria, won and stolen through piracy, kidnapping, and war. You do not want to be on the losing end of a siege, ladies. Remember the fall of Troy? All of its women would have known what awaited them. Abduction, assault, slavery. Not an experience you'd want to time travel back for, but a reality of the ancient world nonetheless. Some estimates say that out of a population of some 250,000 in Athens, a whopping 100,000 of them are slaves. 
Some are privately owned, some public. Owning at least one is seen as an Athenian citizen's right. There are plenty of laborers and craftsmen who are citizens, but many of the people doing the truly hard labor are enslaved. Hesiod writes that, to truly be a successful farmer, you should have an ox and a bought woman beside you. The ironic flip side is that these women get to go out to market and to work, spending more time in the public sphere than your ideal aristocratic Greek woman. They get to live a life out and about, though, of course, not of their own volition. In Athens, the enslaved are all culturally different from each other, but Athenians still look at them and see one thing, barbarians. Women who serve as oiketai, or house slaves, are always busy, tending to the children, washing clothes, cleaning, gardening, grinding grain, spinning. They work closely with the free women of the household, and it seems like these bonds can be deep and lasting. Or so the family's grave monuments, often carved with their slaves' likeness, suggests. Less affluent people probably only own a few, while the richest own more than a thousand. As with pretty much all time periods where slavery is present, the number you own is a symbol of your status. And, of course, both male and female slaves have little to no rights under the law. It's not pretty, but we ancient Greeks seem to accept it as a way of life. Back to life with Tom Hiddleston. We are obviously happy with our choice of husband, but that doesn't mean we have to be stuck with it. Women in ancient Greece can get divorced, though they'll need some male guardian to represent them in court. If you try to stand for yourself, it's not likely to go well. Plutarch tells a story about how when Alcibiades' wife tries to testify at court about his many extramarital dalliances, he drags her away by the hair, and nobody dreams of trying to stop him. If you succeed in splitting up, your dowry will be given back, though not to you, of course, but to the male patriarch of your family. And your ex will get whatever he brought into the marriage. No one wants Greek wives to walk away with nothing. Given the huge age gap in most marriages, it's pretty common for a woman to end up a widow. If we're still of childbearing years, we might be expected to marry again as soon as possible. But for older women, this can be an opportunity for freedom and security. And there's another kind of partnership called a common law marriage. It's very similar to an official marriage, but less binding because it's struck between Athenian citizens and resident aliens, prostitutes, or women who have no dowry. The man you marry is still very much in charge of you, just like in a more official arrangement. The difference is that any kids you have aren't allowed to inherit from the man's family. Though there are eras when this changes, like during the last decade of the Peloponnesian War, when citizens are allowed to have an official wife and a common law one. Several wives living in the same house together has got to make for awkward dinner parties. Here's the rub. Tom married you out of duty and out of the desire to shore up his family line and have tiny Toms to carry out his legacy. But you've spent most of your life at home, have gotten little education on either sex or the world, and probably aren't up for rousing political debates or naughty midnight rendezvous. As our doctors like to say, we ladies only have sex because it's good for our general health. But men, they crave it just for pleasure. So while sex with us is mostly about procreation, our gentlemen companions still have needs to satisfy. As Xenophon ever so gently reminds us, Certainly you don't think men beget children out of sexual desire. The streets and the brothels are swarming with ways to take care of that. If Athens has a lot of one thing, it's ladies of the evening. And it's socially acceptable for our husbands to spend time with them. All meant as a means to keep men from sleeping with each other's wives. In Athens, the penalties for adultery are stiffer than those for rape. Rape is a form of violence, while adultery is a means of luring away a woman's affection and potentially confusing a child's parentage. Men who find their wives in bed with another man are allowed to take the guy's life without fear of punishment. And as a cheating lady, you'll be barred from all religious rights from now on. If you show up anyway, the mob's allowed to do anything they want outside of killing you. So, if you're thinking of sneaking out while Tom's at the symposium, I'd advise against it. You certainly won't be going to the symposium with him. 
These highly ritualized events are ones Tom will go to often. A place to blow off steam that is part serious frat initiation, part straight up frat party. Men go there to debate, talk trash, and join in some playful buffoonery. These parties are legendary. They even have an official master of drinking who mixes the water with the wine and sets the pace for the evening. Wine and opium are the popular party drugs of choice. The point is not to get annihilated, though people must. It's to unwind amongst stimulating company. Sometimes there are drinking games, like this ancient version of quarters where everyone flicks wine into nutshells floating in water to try and make them sink. I would have rocked that game. There are some women present, dancing girls and flute girls hired for the evening. These are in such high demand that a law is passed regulating how many hours a flute girl can work. Wives and daughters are banned from these rowdy happenings, but amongst it all float the enchanting heteri, or female companions, making jokes, having opinions, and leaning slinkily against columns to the great delight of the men they're with. Heteri are usually free women who were once slaves, or medics, or non-native Athenians. These high-class escorts are paid a pretty penny to show men a good time. They aren't the same as common prostitutes, or porne, which means buyable woman, who are often still enslaved and owned and run by a pimp. Those who work the streets are a little freer. They also run their own ad campaigns, sometimes wearing sandals stamped on their bottoms with the Greek words for follow me, meant to leave a trail in the dirt for prospective clients to follow. Helpful hint as a lady of Athens, if you're wearing copious amounts of makeup and you open your own door when someone comes knocking, they're probably going to assume you're a porne. But heteri are different. They sell their charms and intellectual gifts as much as they do their bodies. They're smart, accomplished, and worldly, full of quick jokes and witty banter, because it's their job to be entertaining dinner dates. That's going to be a hard bar for the stay-at-home Athenian wife to climb to. As Athenaeus explains, Is not a companion more kindly than a wedded wife? Yes, far more, and with very good reason. For the wife, protected by the law, stays at home in proud contempt, whereas the harlot knows that a man must be bought by her fascinations, or she must go out and find another. These women know how to delay a man's gratification to the point of obsession, and in doing so, they absolutely slay. As one Hetera says to a suitor in a collection of imaginary Athenian letters, with what must be a massive eye roll, <sighs> I wish that a courtesan's house were maintained on tears, for then I should get along splendidly, since I am supplied with plenty of them by you. These women spend more time in the public sphere and have more influence than most of the women in Athens. Which brings us to a very interesting character, a Hetera named Aspasia. She is one of the only women of this century whose name has made its way down to us through the shifting sands of time. Born in Miletus into a fairly wealthy family around 470 BCE, she seems to have gotten a pretty good education, and she has plenty of opinions she thinks are worth sharing. This medic operates her own salon and girls' school, which, of course, her enemies say is actually a brothel. Side note, male citizens can marry female medics, but male medics who want to shack up with a Greek female citizen have to pay 1,000 drachmas, some three years of living wages. Because she's a medic, Aspasia doesn't have the same constraints as female citizens, and that gives her an in on the city's public sphere. Plutarch, for one, was a little bit obsessed with her. What great orator power this woman Aspasia had, that she managed as she pleased the foremost men of the state and afforded the philosophers occasion to discuss her in exalted terms and at great length. Even the great Socrates apparently shows up at her house parties with his students to chat philosophy with Aspasia and marveled at her eloquence. Great men even brought their wives along to listen to her speeches. Aspasia is so very beguiling that she becomes the common law wife of a guy named Pericles. And Pericles is one of the greatest and best-known politicians of his day. 
Some say she's the key to his success in politics. She's the one who teaches him how to give great speeches. I can just see them in her fancy bedroom, him practicing his speech and her being like, Oh, honey, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Give me that quill. We can do better. Some even whisper that she herself may have written one of his most famous speeches. Get it, Aspasia? Of course, there are plenty of heathens who want to see her torn down. She was often portrayed unflatteringly in plays, and her name was even found on a lead curse tablet. More on that a little later. She's famously taken to trial for impiety, but Pericles defends her, and the charges don't stick. After he dies, she takes a little-known sheep herder as her next husband and grooms him to become a key political leader. Behind every great man is a smart-ass courtesan. And then there's a hetera named Phryne. Born around 371, this it girl of the ancient world was quite a famous lady. Apparently, her name comes from the Greek word for toad, which is a little bizarre seeing as she was a famous beauty. We think her real name was Neseret, which literally means remembering virtue. As a hetera, she mixes and mingles with some of the greatest intellectuals and political figures of the 4th century, who are all keen to be in her general proximity. There's this famous statue of the goddess Aphrodite, carved by Praxiteles, which was said to be one of the most beautiful images of a woman ever carved. It was modeled after Praxiteles' then-girlfriend, Phryne. It's no exaggeration to say that she has some of the most famous breasts in antiquity, which it's said she was fond of bearing as she waded out nude into the sea. But she isn't just a pretty face. She's smart and witty, and so she ends up quite rich. Rich enough that she offers to rebuild the city walls of Thebes after they're destroyed by Alexander the Great. Her only condition? That the walls be inscribed with a sign that says it was paid for by Phryne the courtesan, my kind of woman. But like Aspasia, her wanton ways catch up with her. She's prosecuted for a capital charge, we think in piety, and is defended by the orator and her lover, Hyperides. As part of her defense strategy, he tears away her tunic to let those famous breasts shine free. Only the gods, he says to the assembled judges, could sculpt such a body, and thus killing her would be an act of blasphemy. Her breasts are both famous and legally defensible, flashing her way to greatness. Color me impressed. So let's say, back at home, we suspect that Tom's out cavorting with ladies of the evening, and we want him back at home post-haste. What to do? Well, there's always magic. Despite how rational we Greeks like to say we are, we aren't above casting a spell or two if the situation requires it. The Egyptians pioneered it long before we came around, and if the curse ain't broke, don't fix it. Men who want to make a woman come to them will use an agoje spell. These take some aggressive forms, such as piercing a wax effigy with many needles and reading out the following. Prevent her from eating and drinking until she comes to me. Drag her by her hair, by her guts, until she does not stand aloof from me, and until I hold her obedient for the whole time of my life. Stalk her much? We ladies are more likely to use a gentler philia spell to inspire familial feeling. Or you might curse the hetera he's with using a curse tablet, writing out your curse on a metal slab, then burying it and hoping for the best. But Aspasia would probably tell us we should be friends and stick pins in a doll of our husband instead. <laughs> If you're feeling a bit trapped by it all, have heart. As Greek wives, we still have the opportunity to make our own fun. During the Peloponnesian War, for instance, when men are gone for long stretches, vase paintings show women holding their own symposiums. When the men are away, the women will play and have drunken debates together. There are also regular, socially sanctioned opportunities to get out and let your hair down. Literally, you can actually let your hair down during festivals. Athens has a whopping 170 festival days, many of them religious in nature, during which rules are loosened and women often get to play a starring role. Some festivals are even exclusively for women. Take Thesmophoria, a fall festival held to honor Demeter, the goddess of the harvest, and her daughter Persephone. 
Their story is a good one. Demeter is graciously feeding the world by giving them an eternal summer, just living her best life, until the day Persephone goes out picking wildflowers. Hades, lord of the underworld, takes a fancy to her and abducts her, because, as we know, the gods are rapey as hell. Demeter is devastated, turning so sad that crops die and the world experiences its first winter. When she finds out where her daughter is, she demands her back, but Hades isn't keen to return his pretty captive. So Demeter goes on hunger strike, refusing to feed anyone until they work out some kind of arrangement, which they do. This is where the seasons come from. The spring and summer mark Persephone's return to Demeter, while the turn from fall to winter marks her months spent down below. So it makes sense that men aren't allowed into this festival. Pack your bags and get ready for a three-day ladies-only rager up at the hillside sanctuary of Demeter. Bye, Tom! We time travelers can't be 100% sure about what will go on in this thing, but here's what we should go in prepared for. First, the night before the festival, we're going to a party called the Stenia, where we'll insult each other in the foulest ways we can think of. This may be to simulate how Demeter's friend tried to cheer her up by making fun of her, or maybe just because we have a lot of suppressed rage to let out. Then we're going to sacrifice some pigs. Not nice, I know, but the goddesses require it. We'll put them in a pit called the Megaron and let them ripen there for a few days. There may also be snakes in this pit, or not. I'm hoping not, because bleh. Meanwhile, we're fasting, swearing, and perhaps beating each other with bark whips now and then. Hopefully, at least one woman has smuggled up a very full wineskin to pass the time. On the third day, women called bailers, those who have kept themselves ritually clean during the festival, will bring up the pig carcasses, which we'll lay on an altar. We'll also decorate it with cakes shaped like penises. We're praying for fertility here, after all. Farmers will later take the remains of the pigs and the penis cakes and sprinkle them into their fields as fertilizer. It's just the thing from making crops grow. We will also come out of the house when someone dies. Women play a huge role in the ritual cleansing of a recently deceased person, preparing their body for burial. When Grandpa dies, we'll get him ready for the prothesis, or laying out of the body, by washing his body and anointing it with oil. We'll then dress him and wrap him in a winding sheet, laying him out on a couch so mourners can come and pay their respects. These occasions of celebration and mourning bring women together, giving them an important role to play and a welcome break from the daily grind. Though the shape of the everyday will change depending on which part of Greece we're in, they're likely to look and feel pretty similar. Unless we're talking about ancient Sparta, which we're about to. Because Spartan women have more power and control over their lives than any other women in Greece. Let's spirit our sandaled feet on over and see what life there is all about. Why is the Spartan woman so powerful? Because she bears the children and, as Beyonce would say, then gets back to business. In his Sayings of Spartan Women, Plutarch writes that when a woman was asked, Why is it you Spartan women are the only ones who govern men? She replied, We're the only ones who give birth to men. These ladies are formidable in more ways than one. Sparta really comes into its own when it defeats its rival Athens in the Peloponnesian War, right around 404 BCE. If these guys know how to win one thing, it's war. Do you remember that movie The 300, where Gerard Butler and his studly band of heroes whip out their swords, forever showing off those rippling abs? That battle really happened, and the way they paint Spartan life isn't entirely inaccurate. The Spartans are a militaristic culture that, unlike the rest of Greece, puts the needs of the state above the needs of the family. Think of the way that we use the word Spartan. Adjective. Showing or characterized by austerity or a lack of comfort. You'd best get ready for some sparse living. From day one, Spartan children have it drummed into them that the number one lesson is to follow orders and conform. Even kids deemed fit and pleasantly Spartan aren't going to get much coddling. And because the men are out so much, training and fighting, 
It's up to Spartan mothers to get their kids ready for adulthood. As Plutarch tells us, Spartan nurses taught Spartan babies to avoid any fussiness in their diet, not to be afraid of the dark, not to cry or scream, and not to throw any other kind of tantrum. From the age of seven, boys are sent out to train and learn with their peers as part of a state-sponsored program. Going through an increasingly terrifying series of training and hazing rituals. Wimps need not apply. Here's a charming story for you from our old friend Plutarch. When a bunch of free boys reach the age where they're encouraged to steal to prove their stealthiness and bravery, they steal themselves a young fox. When the owners of said fox come to find it, the boy who happens to have it at hand at that moment hides it under his shirt. The fox goes crazy, clawing at his skin and gnawing a hole to his vital organs, but still, the boy doesn't make a peep for fear of being caught. Later, when the other boys are like, Dude, that's sick. Are you crazy? He said it was, Better to die without yielding to the pain than, through being detected because of weakness of spirit, to gain a life to be lived in disgrace. Yikes. Mothers will not be able to complain to the principal when their kid comes home from their lessons bleeding, and they're unlikely to. Plutarch quotes a Spartan woman who, when her son comes home from training about half an inch away from expiring, tells her relatives, Stop your blubbering. He's shown what kind of blood's in his veins. Such a premium is placed on military fitness that the arts are considered optional. We Spartan ladies aren't likely to learn how to play the lute or read or embroider any cushions. The upside is that we'll get to go out and train. Unlike elsewhere in Greece, young girls are allowed to mix in with boys freely. We'll practice running, throwing a discus and javelin, horse riding, even wrestling. And we do it in peplos that are scandalously short. They leave their houses in the company of young men. Thighs showing bare through their revealing garments, says one guy in a play by Euripides. And this is intolerable to me. They share the same running tracks and wrestling places. After that, should we be surprised if you do not bring up women who are virtuous? If by not virtuous you mean independent, I'll take it. Imagine the difference such training would make for a girl in this or any era. Exercise means learning discipline, gaining strength, a chance to hone and respect one's own body. I have a non-historian-approved theory that female liberation and power throughout the ages is tied directly to how much exercise we're getting. Of course, one of the reasons girls are encouraged to exercise is because Spartans think it'll make them better breeders. As Plutarch says, it meant that partners were fertile physically, always fresh for love, and ready for intercourse. But we do see glimpses of admiration for women who take a more active physical role. Both Herodotus and Xenophon praise societies like Sparta, where women run and engage in sports. As Xenophon has it, If both mothers and fathers were physically fit, their children would be much stronger. Another welcome piece of news is that you can own property and take it with you in your dowry when you marry. As such, Aristotle says, we Spartan women own up to 40% of the property around these parts. When you're old enough, you'll marry a strapping Spartan youth. You'll probably be a bit older than your female counterpart in Athens, and lucky you, your husband is likely to be closer to your age. On your wedding night, you'll cut your hair short, dress in a man's cloak and sandals, and wait in the dark for your paramour to come and ritually capture you. Because nothing sets the mood quite like a little wife napping. But you better be quick in getting down to sexy business. Husbands are shamed for spending too much time in bed with their lady, so he'll have to be back in his barracks before the sun comes up. Spartan men are gone a lot. They don't even live at home, but in the barracks, which is one of the reasons Spartan women enjoy such freedom. They're allowed to not only run the home, but own property, and the men aren't around to get under their feet. But it's also because their ability to bear children is so highly prized and respected. 
Only two kinds of people in Sparta get names inscribed on their headstones, men who die in battle and women who die in childbirth, because they're both fallen warriors. Both sacrifice their lives for the good of the state. Such a premium is placed on a woman's breeding prowess that those who prove good at it can be loaned out to other men for that purpose. As long as she consents, gentlemen. At least, we hope so. Such a culture helps create an independent-mindedness that Spartan women are quite famous for. In Sayings of Spartan Women, we get a glimpse into how hardcore they really are. One woman, who's hit on by a foreign man in robes that are apparently a little womanish, she says, You call that a pass? You couldn't even pass for a woman. Married women sing humiliating songs to men who refuse to tie the knot. It's even said that they kill their sons if they disgrace themselves in battle. Oh my. Some Greeks look down on Spartan women, calling them negligent mothers and saying that all the exercise makes them unattractive. Wait, haven't I heard this argument before about female athletes? I'm squinting right at you, commentators of the 21st century. Aristotle thinks that women's freedom is Sparta's Achilles heel, because it means the men are ruled by their wives. Never mind that those wives are brave, uncompromising, and not afraid to get their hands dirty. They're warriors in their own right. Take Arachidamia. She is a Spartan queen with both wealth and power when the Greek king Pyrrhus decides to take a run at Sparta around 273 BCE. The Spartans are in the middle of a war with Crete, mind you, so most of the men are away from home. Only 2,000 are still within the city, and Pyrrhus' army is not known to take prisoners. So the men left at home decide to send the women to Crete, where they'll be safe. But Arachidamia is having none of that. She and some lady friends head over to the Senate, says our friend Plutarch. With a sword in her hand, in the name of them all, and asked if they expected the women to survive in the ruins of Sparta. They'd stay here and defend their homes, thank you. And the Senate's like, Yeah, okay then. Damn. The ladies help dig a huge trench around the city, and Plutarch tells us that When they began to carry out this project, there came to them the women and maidens, some of them in their robes, with tunics girt close, and others in their tunics only, to help the elderly men in the work. He says the ladies dug at least a third of the trench themselves. Pyrrhus arrives with 20,000 soldiers and many war elephants, which sound like they could be cute, but are actually terrifying. If you don't believe me, go and listen to Ancient History Fangirls episodes on them. Pyrrhus thinks the Spartans will probably pee their chitons and beg for mercy right away, but they don't. They fight. Plutarch says, The women, too, were at hand, proffering missiles, distributing food and drink to those who needed them, and taking up the wounded. He fails to mention what I suspect is true, that some of the ladies might be picking up their projectiles alongside their 2,000 gentlemen friends, making it rain spears on spears. And the Spartans win. Stick that in your ancient pipe and smoke it. And with that image of a Spartan lady throwing pointy sticks at her enemy, our time-traveling day comes to an end. Given how much of Greek history was written by men, we have so few women's stories. But even in their silence, women are everywhere in ancient Greece. Their plays make them central figures in important dramas. Their artwork shows women fetching water, speaking to crowds, reading and dancing. So we can hope that our lives here aren't nearly as constrained and quiet as the ancients want us to think it is. Still, we can assume that those who wanted to break out of their traditional role had a very tough row to hoe. But in the rest of this chapter, we'll dive into the lives of women who did such extraordinary things that they made it into the annals of history, even if just by their fingernails. Making kings, going off to battle, sleeping with gods, and writing epic love poetry. Until next time.
Thanks for listening. If you like the show, consider becoming a patron. It makes all the difference in the world to an indie podcaster like me. You'll be helping to keep the show alive, and you'll get access to exclusive bonus episodes, sneak peeks, behind-the-scenes goodies, and more. Just go to my website and click on Become a Patron. To check out the lady-centric ancient Greek timeline and map I made you, go to this episode's show notes on my website. There you'll also find a transcript, a list of my research sources, music credits, and lots of pictures. Speaking of pictures, check me out on Instagram at The Explores Podcast, on Facebook, or on Twitter at The Explores Pod. The music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of Michael B. Levy, who composes all of his work on recreated lyres of antiquity, giving us a special insight into what ancient music might have sounded like. All songs were provided and licensed by AKMProductionsInc.com, and you can find links to his work in the show notes. A special thanks to the following podcast legends who kindly contributed their vocal stylings. Katie and Nathan from Queen's Podcast, who will make you laugh and cry over badass women from history. Jen and Jenny from Ancient History Fangirl, which takes you deep into the stories of the ancient world. And Sean from Stories of Your and Yours, who reads you classic stories in the most soothing voice you'll ever hear. Their podcasts are some of my very favorites, so check them out. You'll find links to their work in the show notes. Thanks also to the kind friends and family who never fail to delight me with their voiceovers. Andrew Goldman, John Armstrong, Avery Downing, and Simon Denatris. Thanks, as always, to Paul Gablonski, a.k.a. Mr. Explores, for my theme music and logo, and all the amazing pieces of art we've been collaborating on this season. I'd pick up my Spartan sword for you any day.